So thank you, Van, for that. And I want to thank the members of the panel as well for joining. And usually you have about a year and a half to think about what you're going to say. This is much shorter notice. Uh, so we're very appreciative uh, for people joining. Um, and also to thank all of you for, for coming today. Uh, my name is Carolyn Eisenberg, but everybody calls me Rusty because I used to have red hair um, <laughs> in the olden times. Uh, and uh, I'm a professor of U.S. foreign policy, uh, history of American foreign policy at Hofstra University. Uh, I'm on the board of Historians Against the War, and for longer than I like to think, um, I've actually been the co one of the coordinators of congressional activity uh, on the whole range of war peace issues uh, for United for Peace and Justice. So, um, in moderating this, um, you know, I, I bring to it more more thoughts about Congress than anyone should ever have. Um, the reasons for for having this panel are are things self evident, and I'll, I'll just. Uh, restate the obvious, which is that even among uh, historians who think of themselves as progressives, there are um, significant differences in perspective in, in how we relate to the Israel-Palestine conflict. And that emerged pretty clearly over the last year um, when the Hall Steering Committee considered a resolution on boycott, divestment, and sanction which was passed, but we had a divided steering committee, and I think both sides have tried to be respectful of the other. And as many of you in the audience know, that also precipitated a lot of discussion from folks you know, on our membership list about, with, with contradictory feelings um, um, about that subject. So it was really um, the intention, um, I'm, I'm speaking for Van, but I think I know it was in his mind, um, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, to create a space where people um, who really share a common concern but have different ideas about what to do, that we could actually talk to each other um, and, and really explore these perspectives and have a really positive and useful conversation. So that was the goal. Uh, two of our panelists are Mideast uh, specialists who the rest of us are not. Uh, that was in some sense deliberate. Um, on this panel, people have de have varying ideas about what type of investment and sanctions. So there's not a there's not an official line, you know, on that question at all. There's a lot of um, th thoughtfulness and dis disagreement. Um, you know, as thinking about today's event as an older historian, um, I was remembering the first time I ever came to the AHA meeting, which was like really a long time ago, 45 years ago, but actually I see a lot of my friends still here. <laughs> and, you know, and back then, what we were talking about was, do we as historians have a responsibility uh, to take a stand on the Vietnam War? Um, or should we somehow make a distinction um, about how we behave in our professional roles as distinct from what we might do as private citizens. And there was a very, very heated controversy um, then. But when I was thinking, when I was, am I, I'm hoping in the next decade to learn how to use a microphone. Uh, it's worse. It's worse. No, it's worse then. Okay. All right, I'll be back. Um, but I think when we were having that debate 45 years ago, um, there was an elephant in the room when we had that debate, and that was the experience of World War II and the Holocaust. And if there was one lesson so many of us had imbibed, and I think this was especially the case for members of my generation, it was the culpability of good Germans. The nice people who, who just wanted to go on living normally. Um, they had nothing against Jews, they just wanted to, um, you know, to keep on with their lives. Um, denying, of course, the great horrors that were being committed by their government. And so when we had these AHA meetings, and, and, and it, there was kind of a, a, a back and forth that was really predictable when some historian or other would stand up and say um, that the Vietnam War was outside of our professional purview, um, then that would just infuriate other people who um, would stand up and say, you can't do business as usual. Um, you can't try to act normal when your government is committing grave crimes against humanity. And, and I, I really think, 
you know, that, that, that World War II awareness was really always present in those, in those kind of arguments. And I think with regard to the Israel-Palestine conflict, um, I think that elephant in a way is still in the room, although now they're twin elephants. Um, because for many historians, there's that same moral challenge. Right, is can we go about our normal professional roles and not address the inhuman, stultifying conditions imposed by the Israelis on the Palestinians and enabled by the American government every single day? Do we just keep going and act as if that's not happening? And that, that feeling, of course, is very intense. Um, and have people have very, very strong feelings about this matter of ignoring um, trying to be a normal professional or not. Um, but there's the other elephant, there's a twin, which is because the awareness of, of the Holocaust also underpins an acute awareness of Jewish victimization and the creation of the Israeli state as a refuge from oppression. Um, and this too arouses very intense emotions. And so the arguments are very quickly um, inflamed and become very difficult um, to resolve. So fortunately, we've assembled a very calm and friendly group on this panel. Um, and I know you're all eager to hear them.